Good evening, a warm welcome to this evening's service. We meet together as God's people. We're going to start by uh, praising God, by singing together. We're going to be singing, uh, It Was Finished Upon the Cross, a song which invites us to praise God for making forgiveness possible through his death on the cross, which we've been learning about at Easter. So let's stand to sing when the music starts. Let's pray as we stand. Let's pray. Father, be with us this evening as we continue to study your word in Romans. Please encourage us and help us to see how we are not condemned because of our sin, but instead we are forgiven and that we can look forward to eternal life with you. Our lives are full of hope, but also full of sadness as we know so many that don't know you. So help us to be built up and encouraged this evening by your spirit so that we can go out this week with renewed hope. Please help us to listen and learn more about you this evening and give us strength to keep going for the week ahead. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And a warm, uh, please be seated. A warm welcome to uh, tonight's meeting. We're continuing our series uh, in the book of Romans, looking this evening at chapter 8. In way of uh, notices, uh, the one thing to um, flag is on Tuesday it's uh, family fun at the church building, 10 till 11.30, there's flyers out the front. Uh, and these events are, are really, um, they're a golden opportunity to connect with 
the community around us. So please do um, pray for this particular event, pray for new connections uh, and for uh, good conversations. Now each month uh, we have a, a testimony slot and this evening I'm going to uh, interview Aaron. So I'll invite Aaron up now. Uh, and I'm going to just ask um, Aaron a couple of questions just to get to know him a bit and to learn a bit about his uh, Christian life. So uh, I guess just to start off with, for people that don't know you, uh, kind of how did you come to be in Christchurch Hayward Heath? Okay. Let's start. Okay. Um, I was brought up in a Christian family. My parents originally went to Cookfield Baptist Church and then at when my brother was born, when I was eight, Matthew, who went to school with Tom, there, there weren't so many, there weren't any other kids around his age at Cookfield, so um, we came to Christ Church, which was Hayward Heath Evangelical Free Church then, which was where my grandparents went, where my mother used to go originally before she went to Cookfield, and we thought that was a, well, they thought that was a better place for having us so that Matthew could have more kids to grow up with in Sunday school and all of that. Yeah. So that, that, that's where, how I came to Christ Church. And how did you become a Christian? That was quite a bit later. I would say, I would have thought back then that I was a Christian, but that was more of a, my heart was still hardened and is more looking towards works and thinking that I was doing good by what I did but rather than what Christ did for me. So that in probably in my 30s, there was a guy, a young guy in the church called Pete Aston and he uh, put together some Christian had explored and some questions and we did some studies with him. Then he moved away. He, he works with, um, I think, 4-H is one of the team there for one of the, um, what they call it? Trustee, yes, yeah, trustee for them. That's it. Thanks, Graham. So, yeah, so it worked with him. Then probably he went away to Bristol or the West Country, I think, and then maybe a year or two later, Mark asked if I would do studies with him. So we did some one-to-ones on that, and that's, that softened my heart, and that led me to Christ, which uh, the sort of study that we were doing was we were going through some Tim Keller books, and at the time it was Prodigal God, and that was being able to see and identify the two, that there were two, that both sons were away from the father then, and that I was more the older brother, thinking I'd done well and deserved it, rather than everything that Christ had done for me. So then putting my faith in Jesus at that time and coming to faith then. Okay, that's the basics. That's so, the basics. Uh, so when you became a Christian then as an adult, how did life change for you, do you think? Was it kind of a, an overnight change or a slow process after you became a Christian? Um, I would say it's, it was slow. It was a bit of both, I would think. And so was, everything changed at once, but life sort of carried on. And then, but then I wanted to be able to serve more become a member of the church, be baptized, all of those things. And then from that, it's a bit serving in the church with, uh, Sarah took me under her wing to do with the um, kids groups, I think a small talk at the time. So that, I did that for several years and that, that was good. And then work opportunities took me abroad. So then I, I stopped doing that. And while I was away there, I was serving on the um, welcoming team there. And that's sort of when I came back what I was doing here. So okay. it, it's, it changed and it? it's being able to serve and talk about Jesus and serve him in that way. Okay. So the big question I was going to ask was, uh, can you sort of describe some of the peaks and troughs you've had in your Christian life so far? Okay. Um, I, let's see, I met Deborah quite late in, for my age, I think. So I, I was quite, I was accepting that I'd probably be single and just carrying on, but then Things changed on an oak hall holiday that I, I went for the cycling, not for meeting <laughs> la ladies on it. Well, others may have done that, and the <laughs> reputation is for that, but that was not my aim, is it, of it. But uh, unfortunately, that, uh, that was uh, put into a time that I was... I went on that in August, and I was then going to um, Sydney for a six-month secondment for, for work about two weeks later. So we, we did meet halfway in Salisbury, 
in that week. Then I went, we went away, so that was our first date, then we went away, and the second date was in Sydney. Okay, for, for time, rather than for go time. through the, the dating yeah, yeah. process, so, so when, you, when you got married, how did yes. that kind of change your Christian life as an adult? Uh, it's, like, it's serving together and putting others first, putting her first and our needs together rather than just what I thought was best at the time. So it's, it's working together and being a partnership in that, which is... I, I, is how we are with Christ, really, is we're, we're being partners to work together for his glory. Yeah. We I have that partner now to do that. And have you had any sort of difficult times in your Christian um, life so far? Uh, during that, I think my father was diagnosed with cancer while I was out in Sydney. They, my parents didn't tell me about that till a few months into that, though I think it, they knew, suspected it before then, but I, they, they didn't want to make me not go on that travel. So that that was hard, and I had Deborah help me with that. The church around me in Sydney and, and here helped me with that as well when I came back. And how do you think being a Christian changed that experience of your dad well, dying? Well, him dying because he's a belie- he was a believer. He he met regularly with Graham, and a numbers would a number of people would know. But it has it has more of a calmness of knowing where he's going, both for him and for the family and for the church family as well so it's not a saying goodbye forever sort of thing it's knowing that we'll see i'll see him again in glory when i meet him there for your kind of personal life though in terms of not having a father anymore you know do you sort of how does that change your relationship with god do you think i think uh well god is god the father is our ultimate father is the perfect father so that that helps going to him in prayer as well but as Mm -hmm. well as I guess the other parts of it. So we, we, we're adopted into his family. So he has that fatherly love and discipline and all the other things that a father should perfectly embody in that. So mm-hmm. that there's that. So going to him on that, and that's, I guess, led us to looking at fostering as well. So being able to give that um, stability to a young person whenever that happens which which Mm. for a respite for what we're looking to do but that's what why we've done it as we've been blessed with so much that god's given us we want to be able to share that and help those who are in need with it Mm. could ask another 20 minutes of questions but i think we'll leave it there uh because we'll run out of time but thanks so much for sharing we'll pray for Aaron a bit later on and deborah So we're now going to uh, sing our next song, which is uh, On That Day, which reminds us uh, that though we grieve our losses, we grieve not in vain, for we know our crown of glory waits beyond the grave. So let's stand to sing when the music starts.
please be seated. We're now going to have a time of prayer together. Now, the theme this evening is uh, the contrast between life in the spirit and life in the flesh. And John 6 uh, links to this as Jesus in verse 63 says, when talking to the disciples who were grumbling at the time, he says, the spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the spirit and life. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray that we would be people that listen to your word, that would hear what you have to say and understand what it means, and we would allow your Holy Spirit to work in our lives to change us and make us more like you. Help us to not get distracted during our Christian life by the world and all its distractions. Help us to see that the flesh, the things of this world, world will ultimately count for nothing, and that only you can give us life to the full. We can see each week how our world is suffering, wars are threatened to escalate, laws are introduced which are not aligned to your will. People all around us are suffering. We live in a world that has been damaged by sin, so we are all suffering in some form. And we know in a a broken world that we shouldn't be surprised when suffering comes our way. So this week, help, help us if we are suffering to not just dwell on the cause of that suffering, but also to reflect on the impact it is having on our hearts. We pray, Lord, that as we suffer in this life, that you would Give us your spirit to help us to not be tempted to sin or to stray from your word. Help us to see how you meet our needs through your word when in the heat of our battles with suffering. We thank you for working in uh, Aaron's life and Deborah's life, helping Aaron come to faith and providing a wife for him and Deborah and giving him this new exciting chapter in his life. We pray for um, their Um, ambitions to foster and we pray that you would bless that um, opportunity that they have been granted and you would be able to use them uh, in that uh, area of uh, serving. We pray for all of our marriages that you would help us to produce the fruit of the spirits and to love the church and God's people through them. We pray for our mission in Hayward Heath, reaching out to the community around us with the good news of the gospel. We remember the family fun day on Tuesday. Might new people attend and take an interest in attending future children's groups or coming to services? And we pray that this would lead to people coming to know more about you and that their hearts would be changed to see their need for you and become believers. We pray for anyone that may have visited during Easter and that you would plant a seed in their heart so they may want to visit again and seek to know you. Help us as we seek to reach out. Give us wisdom in knowing when to speak, and by your Spirit, help us to speak your truth into people's lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're now going to do tonight's reading, so please turn in your Bibles to Romans uh, 7. Uh, The preach is on Romans 8, 1 to 8, but we're going to read... Uh, from 7 verse 21, just for extra context. It's Church Bible page 1134. So Romans 7 from verse 21. So, I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Therefore, 
There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Well, before Nathan uh, preaches, we're going to uh, sing, Great is the Gospel of our Glorious God, which reminds us we live in a, a dark world, but it is flamed with light uh, when Jesus rose in glory and in my. So let's stand to sing when the music starts. Evening. Uh, I'm Nathan, for those of you who didn't know. Um, let's just pray before we begin. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for songs that proclaim your word, that teach us of your word. 
Um, and we just thank you for this book, for um, the truths, the encouragement, the challenge perhaps we've had from it so far in this series. And we ask that you would continue to teach us from it this evening. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, do have Romans 8 open. That'd be really useful. It's been a few weeks since we last heard from Romans, um, and a long time since we started it. Um, So as a quick reminder, Romans is a letter written by Paul to the believers in Rome, uh, believers from both Jewish and Gentile backgrounds. And he spent the first seven chapters writing about the gospel. Um, And one way of looking at it, at least, is looking at the gospel from the perspective of righteousness. We've seen the righteousness of God shown in his desire and willingness to save sinners. The righteousness of God just in contrast to the unrighteousness of people and the resulting wrath that they deserve. And um, the hope that results from the fact that people can be made righteous by faith. So after his initial greetings back in chapter 1, the gospel is where Paul started. In chapter 1, verse 16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentiles. And one way or another, from this point, Paul has been speaking about the gospel for the first seven chapters. Then chapter 8 acts as a bit of a summary of the gospel, before the letter moves on to some more specific teaching on who God's people are in relation to the Jews and Gentiles, and how Christians can care for one another um, when there are differing views on, for example, the food that they eat, as we'll see in the coming weeks. And the first part of chapter 8, which is our focus this evening, is full of stark contrasts. I wonder if you heard that as it was read. The contrast between life in the spirit and life in the flesh, the contrast between the law of the Spirit and the law of sin and death. And Paul's use of the the word law here links this passage back to all his discussion of the law in the previous chapters. So we will flick about a bit in Romans this evening, so have your fingers at the ready. I want us to see what life in the Spirit and life in the flesh is, and what both of these look like and how we would move from life in the flesh to life in the spirit. I want us to see the difference living in the spirit makes to our lives, should make to our lives, and the overall outcome uh, of living in the spirit as opposed to the flesh. And this is what Paul leads with in chapter 8, verse 1. So firstly, life in the spirit. What is it? What does it look like, life in the Spirit? The passage starts with a therefore. So we have to find out what the following verses are in response to. What is the therefore, therefore? Remember that the chapters and the verses were not added by Paul. He went straight from chapter 7, 25 into chapter 8, verse 1. Um, And Tom read for us from verse 21, didn't he? It says in chapter 7, verse 24, Paul has acknowledged, it doesn't say sorry, Paul has acknowledged that he is a wretched man because of the battle between his inner being, which delights in God's law, and his flesh, which is at risk of being a prisoner to the law of sin. He has also acknowledged his need of being rescued from his flesh. And then verse 25 sees Paul being thankful to God, who delivers him through Jesus Christ, his Lord. It is this rescue through Jesus, which leads Paul to tell us that there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Paul has already covered what it is to be in Christ. Um, He spent the whole of chapter 4 speaking of how Abraham was justified by his faith, his faith in God keeping his promises, and finishes the chapter telling his readers that God will also credit righteousness to those who believe in him who raised Jesus from the dead after being delivered over to death for our sins. And chapter 5 starts with, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith. So who are those that are in Christ? 
It's those that believe Christ died for their sin and that this brought the justification, the being made right with God that God had promised from the beginning. So there is no condemnation for these people. For many of us here this evening, there's no condemnation for those who have been set free from the law of sin and death by the law of the Spirit. That's in verse 2. Again, this links back to chapter 7. Those who aren't in Christ are under the law of sin and death, but those who are in Christ have been set free from it. This isn't to say that we don't still sin, that we don't sometimes appear to be under the law of sin and death. Sorry, I've printed this so small. I'll find it. Yeah. Um, Here we go. (laughs) We heard of Paul's own conflict between the spirit and the flesh in chapter 7. But the fact that there is that conflict, that struggle, that desire to do good and that hatred of the sin we do, this conflict is what shows we are in Christ and therefore free of condemnation. Those not in Christ don't struggle in this way. They are content in their ignorance of God. Then in verse 4, Paul introduces another way of talking about those who are in Christ, um, those who live according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the Spirit are those in whom the righteous requirement of the law has been fully met. That's in verse 3. But Paul has spoken much about human, humanity's inability to meet the requirements of the law. In fact, the point of the law was to show us our sin and our need of an external act to make us right with God. So how have these people, living according to the Spirit, met the righteous requirement of the law? Verse 3 again, the law couldn't do it. It could only show us that we couldn't meet its requirements. Instead, God sent his own son in the likeness of human flesh, in full humanity, as a sin offering. By saying in the likeness of sinful flesh. Paul is making it clear that Jesus was fully human whilst maintaining his deity. He uses the word likeness so that no one will make the mistake of thinking that Jesus himself was sinful. In fact, the only reason he could be a sin offering was that he was perfect, sinless. And this was despite the fact that he was subjected to every temptation that the rest of humanity are as well. But he resisted where we give in over and over again. So there is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. There's no condemnation for those who live according to the Spirit. So the question for us is how do those in Christ, those living according to the Spirit, live? Verse 5 tells us they have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The ESV has it slightly different. It says, those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. So what are these things of the Spirit that we're supposed to set our minds on? We'll hear more about what the Spirit does for us as we look at the rest of chapter 8. But it is these things that the Spirit does that are these things of the Spirit. So briefly, chapter 8 verse 14 tells us that the Spirit leads the children of God. He leads us. Verses 15 and 16 tell us that the Spirit removes the fear of condemnation that came through failing to meet the requirements of the law and gives us assurance of our adoption to sonship. Then in verses 26 and 27, we're told that the Spirit helps us in our prayer life. In fact, The Spirit enables us to have a prayer life. The Spirit intercedes for us, as is God's will. We have a a similar passage in Colossians 3, verses 1 to 4. Paul writes, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. 
When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So instead of using the phrase, set your minds on the things of the Spirit, uh, Paul uses, set your hearts or minds on things above. But these two phrases can be taken to mean the same thing. So what are the things above? That Christ is seated at the right hand of God, and that our lives are hidden with Christ, and that we will appear with him in glory. Timothy Keller summarizes the things of the Spirit, the things above, as the fact that those in Christ have been raised with Christ and are accepted in him before the Father. On this topic, he says, we are to drill into our minds and hearts his love and adoption of us and never forget our privileged standing or the fact that we are loved and to let this dominate our thinking, our perspectives, and therefore our words and actions. So the question for those of us in Christ this evening is, is my mind set on the things of the Spirit? Are we drilling these truths about what the Spirit does for us, teaches us, and enables us to do into our minds? This isn't a passive thing that just happens. Our minds will be filled with whatever shouts the loudest at us, and by what we tell ourselves is the most important thing. Is the fact that I am a child of God, given assurance of justification, and able to approach God himself the most important thing to me? Is that the most important thing to you? Is it the best thing that I will hear each day? Because that sin still living in us, like it still lived in Paul, will tell us otherwise. So what does living according to the Spirit actually look like then? And how will this look different to the person living according to the flesh? The person living by the Spirit will have an eternal perspective, looking forward to the day when Jesus returns and those in him will appear with him in glory. Do we have this perspective, this eternal perspective, Do we follow Paul's advice to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 7, where he says that time is short and the world is passing away, so those of us who buy things should live as though this thing wasn't theirs to keep, and those of us who use things of the world should live as if not engrossed in them. Corrie ten Boom summed up this way of living as she said, hold loosely to the things of this life so that if God requires them of you, it will be easy to let them go. I'm probably not the only one here holding a little more tightly onto many things of this life. My home, my income, my freedoms, my, just my ease of life. This is at odds with what that eternal perspective that comes from living according to the Spirit. This holding tightly to the things of this world is the law of sin that Paul speaks of winning, despite the fact that we've been set free from it. This is a challenge to me. Perhaps it is to you too. So how else will... Didn't put page numbers on either. Um, Yep, turning over. How else will the person living according to the Spirit live? He will use his time to learn from what the word, learn from the word, what it is to live a life pleasing to God and live in this way, in thankfulness for what God did by sending his own son to be that sin offering. To do this, the person living by the Spirit will look at how Jesus lived and will seek to emulate this while acknowledging he'll never get it perfectly right. So he'll be humble He'll put everyone before himself. He'll only speak the truth, even when it's not what others want to hear. He'll love those that the world doesn't love and include those the world rejects. And he'll ultimately be concerned for his father's glory. So all the things that come naturally to us, or not, probably all the things that require a conscious effort, as well as an ongoing reminder to ourselves that We're not living this way to bring our justification. We're living this way because of our justification through Jesus. 
This living can only come from an ever-deepening knowledge of God's word. And this only comes with discipline. It is so much easier to put on the TV than read and study the Bible. It's so much easier to read the latest murder mystery or legal thriller than it is to get stuck into the scriptures. It's even easier for some to head to the gym or go for a run than it is to hear from God in his word. Where on your priority list is God's word? Because you can't expect to be demonstrating that you're living according to the spirit if it's not at the top of this list, along with prayer and meeting with the Lord's people. TV, fiction, working out, relaxation, holidays, time with family and friends, and so many other things aren't necessarily bad things. Many of them are good gifts from God, but when it's these things that take the top spots on our priority list, the law of sin and death is winning again, not the law of the Spirit. Again, this is a challenge to me. Perhaps it is to you too. Remember, the key result of living according to the Spirit is no condemnation. And verse 6 states this again in a slightly different way. The mind governed by the Spirit is is life and peace. The life mentioned there is not life now. People whose minds are governed by the flesh are also alive now. This life is eternal life. Life that Romans 6.23, sorry, remember, that Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. Humanity's natural position is deserving of death and an eternity in the absence of God's presence and therefore in the absence of anything good. But the verse goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life in or through Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the gift given to those in Christ, those living according to to the Spirit, those whose minds are governed by the Spirit. And what comes with this life? Peace. We are not being promised peace now in every aspect of our lives. In the New Testament, there are many mentions of the trials and tests. The stark warning is there. As Christ, thank you that this passage um, makes that way that justification those who care as much as you do, as much as Jesus would, about the lost, those living in the flesh, about those who do face that condemnation. And we pray that we would make it clear in our life, not the only life possible, that it won't bring the fulfillment that it often promises to, but that only you can do that. And we pray that many more would go from life in the flesh to life in the spirit by your amazing grace brought about through Jesus' death at the cross. And so we thank you and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We can only sing one song to finish when we started with, therefore, there is now no condemnation. We need to sing, and can it be? So let's stand and sing.